So today is session three for training for job placement providers to assist individuals with vision loss find employment. Today we're going to go over some common courtesies, learned helplessness, light and glare control, assistive technology, which are like low vision aids and low tech devices and high tech devices. Um, we'll talk about how to manipulate the working environment. We'll talk a little bit about orientation and mobility, and then some barriers that you as providers and the individual with vision loss will have to go through. And then I provided you with some handouts when I had sent out the calendar invite. There's some common courtesies and um, the learned helplessness sh sheet of paper, and then a cited guide handout to reflect back on in the future. Again, for this session, we will be doing code words. And so throughout the session, keep track of those code words. And at the end, you can go ahead and email me and I will send you an email back with your certificate of attendance for CESP credits. So some of the common courtesies is treat people with vision loss just like you would treat anybody else. You speak normally to them. Sometimes people will think that people with vision loss can't hear, so they talk louder to them, but you don't need to do that, so just speak normally. And they sometimes can tell who you are by your voice, but it's always best to state your name when you start a conversation with them. And also, it's best to let them know when you leave because they might continue the conversation and you're not there. So always, always introduce yourself and then let them know when you're leaving. And if you're leaving somebody that's standing, don't leave them in the middle of a room. You know, put them next to a chair or have them feel the wall. That way they can orientate themselves. And always just ask before you help them. Ask how you can help them. Sometimes they might want help, sometimes they might not. And we'll go through some techniques later about how to have them take your elbow. Um, don't have them hold your hand or don't, don't grab their shoulder. Um, be descriptive about environments when you're around them. That way they can get a clearer picture. And when you're guiding them, warn them of any danger, like a low branch, if you're walking outside with them. They, you might duck, but they might not because they don't see it. And you might have to walk just a little bit slower if you are guiding them. And if you are guiding them, be careful because you're responsible for them because you are assisting them. And when you address someone with vision loss directly, um, just like if you're using an interpreter for somebody that doesn't speak the same language, you do talk to that person directly. So don't talk through, like if somebody's guiding them, don't talk to their guide, just talk to the person with vision loss directly. And it is okay to tell somebody with vision loss to say, hey, look here, or, you know, see this. Just those common sayings that we say, but it's not okay to say, over there you'll, you know, Look over there because they have no idea where you're pointing. And as you talk to them, look at them directly when you're speaking to them, um, just like you would with somebody with vision loss. And it's helpful to describe a layout of a room when you're with somebody, that way they can orientate themselves again. And don't assume or presume that somebody can't accomplish any given task just because they have vision loss. And these individuals have abilities, they just may have some limited vision. And they should be aware of what accommodations that they need. So just ask them what they, they might need for accommodations. Um, two people, like we talked about in the past presentations, two people with the same diagnosis, the same visual acuities, and the same visual fields will function very differently. And then people with vision loss, they do sometimes take a little bit longer to complete some tasks. 
And then also ask them about their vision loss, but don't dwell on it. And then let them know they should advocate for themselves. And that's a big push for independence that we have here. They should advocate, they should tell others what kind of accommodations they need. And ask them again what accommodations they might need and what they would need that, what kind of materials would be best for them to use, um, large print, audio, or braille. Um, organization is very important to somebody with vision loss. So if you touch something on their desk, make sure you put it right back where it was um, because then they might not be able to find it again or it might take them a lot longer. And one technique that we use is a clock method. So let's say, for example, if somebody is out to lunch with you and they ask you what's on their plate, say, well, you've got potatoes at three o'clock and your steak at six o'clock and your beans at, at 11 o'clock. That way they can actually get a visual in their mind of where their food's at on their plate. And then also with people with vision loss, we, we come across learned helplessness. So Bob, take that away. Thank you. Learned helplessness is a somewhat common problem. We see it every so often at the rehab center. Um, when a person has lived a life of rejection and they, they try one method to get a sec acceptance, and it doesn't work, um, they try another method, it doesn't work. They try another method, it doesn't work. And they keep being rejected and they are denied acceptance. And over time, this can have a very detrimental um, effect on the person. What happens is they, they just start to throw up their hands and say, no matter what I do, Good or bad, nothing matters anymore. I have no control over what's happening in my life at this point in time. Just no matter what I do, bad things happen. And they, they get this approach to life where all is bad, nothing works, and I just, I can't do anything to impact my, my surroundings or the people around me. There are several things that you can do. And one of those is to see the present as different from the past. The past is gone. It's what has happened before. Today is different. Yesterday, people laughed at me. Today, people aren't laughing at me. Yesterday, people threatened me. Today, people aren't threatening me. So see the present as different from the past. Also, direct a person very positively. Um, rather than saying, don't do this, say, this is what I want you to do. And that positivism rubs off eventually. It may take quite a while, but it will. Capitalize on a person's personal worth. Um, make sure that uh, they understand their value and not just their value, but their skills and abilities and that value to this company that you are helping them become employed with. Um, make sure that when you are working with them that you absolutely identify a clear goal. And once you've identified that goal, work up a list of steps, small steps, to achieve that goal and take one step at a time, make it a small, very achievable step and reinforce the success after you've worked on that particular step. Help them reframe their thoughts about the negative things that will happen in their future. In other words, uh, if they have a failure, and obviously I'm using that term very generically, um, help them reframe that as a learning tool. 
In other words, it's not a failure. I have learned what I should not do. Now I have a better picture of what I should do. Um, also, teach them to work on positive self-talk. I'm a good person. I do good for people around me. I make, I make life better. Um, I am a value to this company, etc. And then try to teach problem solving. Um, problem solving allows a person to think about identifying what went wrong and then to see what the options are to change for the future and then to test those options to see what the outcomes are and then to select the, the very best approach to uh, successfully accommodate that problem. Um, make sure that, again, you take very, very small steps. Be sure to reinforce initially all successes and then gradually fade out the number of times that you reinforce. Reinforce every second time or every fourth time or every tenth time and gradually decrease how much input you have in terms of the reinforcement of that person. And if there is a failure, simply encourage the person. You know, everybody fails. We have to, we have to see this in the light it, it occurred in. Uh, we couldn't predict it. It occurred. Now we know what to expect. We can fix it for the future. And I'll give it back to you. All right. All right, let's talk a little bit about assistive technology. So assistive technology would be some kind of technology that helps that person do their job a little bit easier. So most commonly it is computer programs and the accessories that go along with it. So as we talked last session about magnification, so making things bigger. So using a large screen monitor you know, would help that individual to increase the size of the things on their screen. Because if you use a little screen, you're going to run out of room when you increase things. So as you have a larger monitor, you can enlarge things and see them a lot better and not run out of room as much as you would with a smaller one. Synthetic speech, so that would be programs that take the print on the screen and verbalize it. And so, for example, like an iPhone with Siri, that's, that is synthetic speech or uh, JAWS that's listed below that takes everything on the screen and tells you what is on the screen. Document readers. So a common one is called open book. So it's got a camera on it and it takes a picture of a sheet of paper and then it will read that sheet of paper. And scanners do the same thing, just like uh, when you scan something and email it, but it will scan and then it can read what is on that sheet of paper. And JAWS, as I mentioned, it is a computer program that you don't even need your monitor. It just, it will read everything that you would have had on the screen for individuals that don't see the screen. So JAWS is mostly for people that have no vision, where magnification would be too high, too strong, too big in order for them to use the computer. So then they go to JAWS. And with JAWS, they don't use the mouse because they're not using the monitor, they use keystrokes. But the difficult thing with JAWS is that some specific computer programs aren't compatible with JAWS. Uh, we are learning that more internet-based computer programs work better with JAWS rather than specific ones that are designed for a company. They're not as accustomed to using a program like JAWS. Um, enlargement programs such as Zoom Text is very common, and so it takes everything on the screen and enlarges it. Um, as a temporary fix for some individuals that have slight vision loss, 
you can hit the control key on your keyboard and use the scroll on your mouse and that works a lot for for word documents or for internet based if you pull up the internet and you do that it can enlarge what's on the screen or what's on that web page cctv stands for closed circuit televisions and that is like a monitor that has a camera underneath of it and so you put a piece of paper underneath the monitor underneath where the camera's at and it shows up on the monitor and so those can be connected and sit next to a computer and so some individuals that have to read a lot of paperwork for their job they'll have that right next to their computer so they can slide it right under the right under that camera see what's on that piece of paper and then type it into their computer and we're noticing that a lot of apple products have been very accessible for people with vision loss uh, siri has done quite a bit to help individuals and then uh, we'll talk on the next page some apps that have been very helpful but i wanted to mention that uh, for some people with vision loss the keyboards are not very high contrast and so we will use some computer keyboard overlays that i'm showing on the screen so overlays such as these uh black on yellow or black with white they're bold print and they make it a lot easier to see a computer or see the keyboard um, they're just little stickers that usually somebody will assist the person with vision loss to put those stickers on and it just makes it a lot easier for them to use a keyboard the newest app that has been most helpful for people with vision loss is called seeing ai right now it's only for iphones but in this app it can identify colors it can scan barcodes it can you can use the you use the camera on your iphone to to point at these objects and so if you point it at environmental objects it can tell you what's around you if you point the camera on your iphone towards a person it will identify that person it'll tell you it's a female it'll, it'll guess what age they are sometimes it's kind of funny but uh, it can also read handwriting, which has been very difficult for people with vision loss, finding an app that can read handwriting. And so this app is very unique and able to do that. And then also it identifies money. And for people with Android phones, there are individual apps out there that can do these similar things, but then they would have to download an individual app for each thing they need help with, where the Seeing AI app has all in one. So some low vision aids, um, like we talked about last session, lighting is huge. And so uh, different lamps, just identifying the difference between an incandescent light versus a fluorescent light and versus an LED. With incandescent, you're going to get that warm yellow lighting with fluorescence kind of a brighter white and with led it's going to be kind of like a cool bright blue um, they can all be on different spectrums but most commonly that's kind of what they show up as and they affect each individual differently some people with different types of eye diseases prefer one lighting source over the other and then remembering you know the difference between using a desk lamp or an overhead light or even some individuals that need a little more direct light can wear a head light a little strap around their head with the camera or with the light right on their forehead so it's pointing directly where they're looking the next is solar shields so i have a few examples um, solar shields are like tinted different colored sunglasses but the difference between a solar shield is that it's got protection over the top from the sun and a lot of protection from the side and then also from the bottom. So they're going to want to wear sunglasses that have full protection that cover their glasses. For example, these are a fit over pair, so these will fit 
over somebody's individual glasses and then it'll protect them from the light all around. And so depending on their vision, they're going to like different colors where this is a gray color and then this one would be more of an amber. So an amber reduces more light where the gray would black out or an amber reduces more glare and then a gray will reduce more light. And depending on their vision, they may need more light so the gray won't be as helpful for them. The new color that's out there right now is a rose colored and this has been found to help individuals with migraines. So this is pretty unique. And then also with individuals that have a lot of glare issues, they like to use a yellow. So with this yellow, again, it you know blocks light from the side and from the top and from the bottom and the yellow some individuals will actually wear indoors for places like Walmart or Target or um, Hy-Vee where those fluorescent lights are too bright as they're walking through and also early in the morning or in the evenings when the sun is going down and they need that extra contrast. For magnifiers uh, we have stand magnifiers. For example, this is a stand magnifier where it is going to sit directly on a piece of paper and then they're going to look directly into the magnifier. And magnifiers are lighted, usually with an LED light that lasts a long time so it doesn't need to be replaced. And then a different type of magnifier would be more like a pocket magnifier. So they could just carry this around and do some spot reading. And so these are handy for people that want to see a price tag at a store or just need to do some quick check. Because magnifiers are not very helpful for long term, long time reading. Like they can't just sit down and read a book um, because it'll cause a lot of fatigue. Where the electronic magnifiers, such as a portable CCTV, with these magnifiers, uh, it, is, it makes it easier to do long-term reading. And the nice thing about these is that you can change the contrast of, of what's showing on the screen. Bob is a little black and white. <laughs> um, let's see. It's generally meant for things which are much closer. Yes, yes. And so changing the contrast helps individuals with different forms of vision loss see things a little differently and eases that eye strain. And then also with the portable CCTV, you can change magnification on it. So that's very helpful for people that might need a little bit magnification and then their, as their vision gets worse, a lot of it, or a lot more magnification. And they may also use some type of telescope. And so a monocular is very common. Um, binocular is becoming a little more common, but just having a monocular you know, around their neck, they can spot street signs, or if they're walking through Hy-Vee and they wanna see what aisle they're at, they can use the monocular look up, check what aisle they're at, see what's at a distance. And uh, with the solar shields, I should mention that they typically are polarized to help protect your, your eyes even more and also have an anti-glare, anti-reflective coating on them. So you're not going to get like uh, some issues with the reflection. And some low-tech devices so these things would be like a bold pen like a thick marker or bold line paper and some individuals like I said prefer different colors so bold line paper could be like this for example which is a pink piece of paper that has thick black lines on it or even a green and I know they make them in multiple different colors so these are two examples of bold line paper 
green or pink with a very bold black line. And some writing guides, we mentioned that word last time. So for example, this would be a writing guide. It's a black piece of plastic with cut out lines. And so they could write, if they wanted to hand write a letter, they would just put this piece of plastic onto a piece of paper and then they would write right in between where the cutouts are. And then they can follow the cutouts. This would also be good for writing a grocery list or writing a to-do list or at a staff meeting, if that's how they prefer to take notes. And another example of a writing guide, let's say they have to write some checks for the company. So they're going to take a check and then they have a writing guide that has cutouts specifically for a check. So they can follow the different cutout areas and fill it in accordingly. And another writing guide, let's say they have to address an envelope. So here's an envelope. And they put the writing guide right on top of it. It's got cutouts for the upper left to write the address of um, the return address. And then it's got cutouts on the the middle bottom right for addressing where they want the envelope to go. Some marking uh, people even on their keyboard. There's a little tiny mark on your F and on your J. So sometimes people might need a little bit more on their keyboard and they like to put these little rubber dots these dots also are helpful on a microwave or on a stove or uh, depending on what their job duties are. If they have just a little bump dot somewhere that they can feel to quickly access something instead of having to use their vision and get up close to try to find where they need to push. It could even be helpful on a phone if they needed just to have a thicker bump dot on the number five, if they or if they use a, num a number specifically, if they're calling a variety of different people and have a lot of buttons on their phone, they could put a bump dot specifically next to the button that they need to use more often. And another thing with um, bump dots is puff paint. Uh, sometimes you can buy it, this one's specifically is called spot inline pen, but it's just like puff paint. It's a little more, um, con or what's the word I'm looking for? You can use it over a variety of different things. Um, it's easier to mark on uneven surfaces. It is very contrasting and also it is very tactile. Um, I have a map, for example, of our front entrance which is in puff paint. I merely drew it out. And at that point, I drew the puff paint over the top of it to show the different parts of our front office. And it's very tactile. You can feel what's happening. And also what's helpful for people with vision loss is limiting items organizing, labeling. I have some Braille. These are stickers that have a contrasted large print uh, letter on them also with the Braille. And then so uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. So for people that don't know Braille, um, they may find there's some technology out there for for identifying things, uh, the pen friend where it's got a sticker and you verbalize what is on that sticker and you put that sticker on an item. And then when you cross the pen friend over that sticker, it will tell you what that item is. And some individuals use like rubber bands on, for example, to tell the difference between their shampoo and conditioner. They'll put one, wrap, one rubber band on the shampoo and two rubber bands on conditioner. So just finding their own way to label things and just um, organization. If, if you got a can of, of green beans and a can of soup, you know, put the green beans on the left, always on the left, and just continue to stay organized. 
Um, if their work desk is cluttered, that would affect them greatly. So limiting the clutter on their work desk and also organizing files on their work desk, labeling, they could use some of these to label their files. Um, just each individual is different and just helping them find what is helpful for them to organize will be the key. These techniques are also priority. So, for example, if you have many items, I, I think of um, we have fruits, vegetables, and canned meats, and maybe other things that we have in a, a cabinet, and they're all kind of mixed together. It would be extremely difficult for a person to try to know what is in a particular can. If we could limit to the things that we actually are going to use and take out all the things that are expired and all the things that we're not going to use, um, if we took all those out, that would greatly reduce the number of items that they have to go through to be able to actually find what they're looking for. Then if they organize them into, let's say one cabinet or one, one part of the cabinet is for vegetables, the next part of the cabinet is for fruits and the next part of the cabinet is for anything else, then we could put them in order maybe of preference. I like peaches, I like pears and I like plums. I'll begin with a P, I don't know where I came up with that. But anyway, um, if I could organize in that way, I would know that if I wanted a can of peaches, I would just grab the first row of cans. And then if I needed to further label, I could use labels to label any one of those in a, in a means that would identify it for me. So that's just another nice way how it's used. And, and these should be prioritized. Limiting should come first then organizing should come second and then labeling last because it's limiting is going to make everything much quicker. Organization is going to again enhance the quickness and the efficiency of finding something and labeling is the least efficient because it takes an awful lot of effort to read a label. And lastly, filtered sheets or colored paper Sometimes it can be difficult to ask your boss to print the agenda on colored paper, but if they prefer, if, yeah, if black on white is difficult for them to see and they've got some glare issues or they need more contrast, they can have this plastic filter that goes directly on the sheet of paper and then they'll be able to see the agenda a little bit better. And so some individuals prefer to use just a plastic filter. Very reasonable accommodation. Uh, and very easy to find. You can go to any office supply center or probably even Walmart or a store similar to Walmart because these are nothing more than sheet protectors or report protectors and you can buy large quantities of them very very reasonable in a multitude of colors another common color is a light pink or a rose colored so it just eases the eye strain um, so it's just a very light pink and it's just very easy for individuals also if they're running late for work and they say, you know, I just don't have an alarm clock, a talking alarm clock is beneficial. Um, technology, there's a variety out there. Timers, you know, setting timer, that way the individual doesn't have to try to figure out what time it is, just setting timers for themselves. Reminders, you can do that on your phone now. Uh, note takers, such as a recorder, this is a good idea for people to use a recorder to make a grocery list. If they aren't able to handwrite a grocery list using a recorder or using a recorder to remember phone numbers or addresses, uh, a recorder is a very common note taker for individuals with significant vision loss. Or even just bringing things closer to them. So having a lap desk or a raised desk, that way they can bring things closer to them it will help maximize their vision. 
Okay, now we're going to review a little bit about how you can manipulate the environment. And the first thing we need to note is that it is the fastest, easiest solution to working with a person. Changing a person and what they do is, is much more difficult than rearranging furniture or um, improving the environment somehow, uh, making the pathway straighter. Um, so it just, it's, it's the easiest thing to do. We want to change the environment first, then add devices and change the person. Make sure that the workstation is comfortable and ergonomic and use stands if at all necessary. Stands would be something to hold the paper up like a secretary would hold something up in order to be able to quickly look at it and um, be able to see what they're typing. Um, adjust size and boldness, use a CCTV. Size and boldness is very, very important. Uh, if a person can't quite read regular print, but they could read it if it was just a little bigger, we could take that regular print, put it on a copier, and copy it a little larger, enlarge it, and we are getting both an increase in size and an increase in boldness and the person can access it. And again, using some of the low tech things that Kelly was just talking about also enhances their ability to use it. A CCTV is a, essentially a magnifier. It takes a picture of whatever the document is and then makes it larger, large enough for the person to be able to see. And this can be extremely large so it is a very valuable tool. The other thing is, again, contrast colors. Um, if, I can't, if I can't quite see where my cup is because I have a black cup on a dark table, it would be very easy to put down a, a placemat and then put the dark cup, a light colored placemat, the dark cup onto that light color placemat and put milk in the dark cup because then I can see the contrast to the milk also. The next thing obviously is to reduce clutter. If I have more things to search through and to have to feel and possibly knock off of whatever the table is or the workstation, um, that's going to be a problem. If I can reduce that, I can really enhance my environment. Um, keep a consistent background. If the person is looking out against the wall that is, is uh, I, for lack of a better term, psychedelic, it's just, it's a milieu of various items in the background. It makes it hard for me to see things in the foreground. This is a tiger in the jungle kind of thing. If we had a, a completely orange background, we'd be able to see the tiger. If we had a completely black background, we'd be able to see the tiger. But in the jungle where it's a milieu of different colors and shapes and sizes and whatever, uh, it becomes very extremely difficult to find the tiger. Um, it's a where's Waldo thing. There's just too much in the background. So the way to reduce that would be to put a barrier up just a small barrier. It could be simple cardboard or a cubicle wall or just even something around the, the com computer monitor that helps set the computer monitor apart from the rest of the environment. Rearrange the room to put windows at the client's back. This is a very simple thing to do. Turn the desk around. Uh, put the clients back to the windows. Uh, that way they're not looking into the brightness, makes it a lot easier. Fluorescent lighting can be very glary for many people. Um, they walk into Shopco or Target or Walmart or even the grocery store, and those rows and rows of fluorescent lights are just too much to take. Um, simple things, wear a cap if it's possible. Now, some jobs we can't do that. But what we could do is maybe darken some of the lights that are shining in the, the student's eyes. 
another thing might again be to have the student turn around or turn to a different direction. Another thing might be again to um, manipulate literally what is over the top of the computer so or over the top of the monitor. Um, I have used like a, a shelf of cardboard that just literally comes out from the computer monitor and it isolates the computer monitor in the background, but it also shades it from all the glare that was coming from above. Um, another thing is to add mirrors. Now mirrors are very unique. Um, with a mirror, we if, if I have like a field cut, a field problem where my field is greatly reduced, I can only see a little bit directly in front of me if I could put a mirror next to my monitor, I could watch the door. And if I put it on both sides, I can see what's going on all around behind me. Uh, also, mirrors do something. I wish I could explain this, but I cannot explain this. I, I don't know exactly what's going on. I do know it works. If a person were to take a mirror and place it up next to their eye and turn their head and eyes to look into the mirror and reflect what it is they want to see. Very often, even with people with good vision, it works for me. Um, if you reflect in a mirror what is happening in the environment, it can be much clearer, much easier to see. One thing that I know that's impacting it is that we are changing the direction of the, the light. We are looking away from this side, which is where I want to see, and we are looking into the mirror, but we're looking in a new direction. We're looking in this direction instead of this direction. So that I do know. The other thing I suspect is going on is it puts the image right next to their eye right here. So people with macular degeneration seriously can be um, benefited by using a mirror to reflect images in the environment. Also, a mirror allows you to see yourself very, very closely. So if you have macular degeneration, that's a very good uh, thing to do. Bring that, that mirror right up and they can see to shave and see to find out what's going on with their face, see if their makeup is on correctly or whatever to take a look at their hair. So adding mirrors is a very simple thing to do. It's extremely cheap. I go down to the dollar store and I usually can pick up two mirrors for a buck, a small little compact mirror that I could use at the grocery store and a larger mirror that I can reflect my face in when I wanna see after I brush my teeth and comb my hair, etc. The next thing is to add devices to assist the client. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, a large print clock could be very, very beneficial. A braille note allows a person who is totally blind to take notes in meetings and to be able to retrieve them later. So just simple little things. What is the problem? What device will resolve the problem? And then add that device. The next thing is, again, lighting is a big issue, and we want to add lighting or remove lighting to make the lighting best for that particular individual. Another thing is simply opening and closing shades. If I don't have enough ambient room light, I'd like to use a very good light. Outside light, light from the sun is excellent for most people but we have to reduce the light sources. So if we put the, the light source, the window, for example, to the person's back and it's cascading over the shoulder of the best eye, we have the best possible lighting. So we can increase ambient room light by opening a window. On the other hand, if, if there are lots of windows or they're in a direction we cannot control, then maybe we need to close shades so that the person is able to see what they need to be able to see better. The next thing is to reduce glare. 
a lot of reducing glare is the direction we're looking. And again, turning around is so easy to do. Or adjusting. For example, I look at the monitor screen that I'm looking at right now. If I'm seeing a light in the background, by tilting my screen a little bit, I might be able to reduce the glare. Um, by removing reflective things that are in the environment, excuse me, <laughs> I was using my hands a little too much. Um, by reducing the bright brightness in the background, I might be able to reduce some of the glare to the eyes of a student, etc. Um, using sunglasses and filters, very good for reducing glare and at the same time, many of them either decrease the amount of light so that it's easier for me to see, or it can actually enhance contrast. And enhancing contrast by putting on a pair of filters, sunglasses, oh, makes it so simple, so easy to improve the environment. And one thing I would suggest if your student, if your client has not had a low vision exam, they need a low vision exam. Uh, during a low vision exam, an eye doctor, an optometrist will evaluate their vision, make sure their prescription change is appropriate, make sure that they are using it correctly. Then they can get into magnifiers and uh, sunglasses and telescopics and various techniques, CCTVs and, and uh, portable magnifiers and lighting and all kinds of things they can talk to them about that increases their probability of being able to see whatever they want to be able to see. So if they haven't had a low vision about, get them in. Suggest to the counselor that they get one. Um, Again, using different types of lights, sunlight, incandescent fluorescent, LED halogen, high intensity, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes different colors of light. It's the same as using a filter. We can add contrast depending upon the eye problem by changing the color of the background. The next thing is move the light closer or get closer to the object. We've talked about these a few times too. Um, last, assure that there is no direct light to the eyes. That creates a whiteout. Uh, a very good example of that is when you have, uh, uh, you're driving at night and a car is approaching you. As the headlights of that car that's approaching you get closer and closer, it makes it more and more and more difficult for you to be able to see past that car. And when you have a vision problem, the, the glare problems, the lighting problems become so much greater. Right now I'm dealing with secondary cataracts and the least little bit of light changes how I can see it all. Uh, it just tends to milk it out. It just becomes milky and foggy in the background. So I tend to want to control my um, glare problems with a tinted sunglass. Um, again, we want to uh, assure that the light is in the right direction. Generally speaking, if we're trying to see an object in front of us, the light should cascade over the shoulder of the better eye. But there are circumstances where that doesn't work, like with a computer monitor. If we have it coming over the shoulder of the better eye, we're going to see it in the screen. So now we have to either adjust the angle of the light or we have to adjust the angle of the screen. Then we want to reduce the number of overall light sources if it's possible. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes we can't manipulate that. But if we can manipulate that, it would be wise to manipulate that. And again, we want to take a look at ambient light, which is the general brightness of the room, as opposed to a focused light, like a reading lamp. 
And again, windows at the client's back, very useful. And to use, again, the color overlays and any, any means of contrasting or improving the contrast. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to take this time to answer any questions you may have. That was a lot of information. I just want to remind you that if you want to know more about low vision aids or lighting, just always feel free to send us an email, give us a call, and we can go farther in depth. And there is such a variety of different colors of filters out there that, like Bob said, having a low vision exam, they're going to have all those different colors of filters and be able to show them. And once they put on a certain type of colored sunglasses you can tell instantly that eye strain is gone and so just having those clients ex experience putting on a different type of sunglasses can change a lot but feel free to, to ask any questions also at this time i'm going to give you your first code word which will be jaws that computer program that is a text to speech program uh, so J A W S is that first code word, JAWS. And so you're unmute unmuted at this time. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask or type them into the chat box. All right, we're just going to jump into the next section then. Okay, the next things that I want to teach you, actually I want to inform you about, are techniques that can help a person who is blind or visually impaired know about their environment and be able to get around. Now, before I get into this, I really want to talk about it a little bit, do a little disclaimer here. I'm not teaching you how to teach your student, how to teach your client. That's not the point. The point is to know what the client should be able to do. If you know what they should be able to do, if they can't do it, then you know you might need some help with the situation. You also will be able to know when orientation and mobility intervention is warranted and needed. And you'll also know enough to be able to make some helpful suggestions if there is a small problem that you can correct very quickly. If you find that you cannot correct a problem, then obviously orientation and mobility services will be needed. So, to begin with, we want to begin an orientation to the environment. Okay, so first of all, you want to identify the routes the person is going to be taking, and we want to include all the places they're going to go. Um, it's not just getting from the front door to their workstation. They need to be able to get to the bathroom and to the lunchroom and to the boss's office. So. And there may be other routes too that they need, but those are routes they're probably going to need. In which case, we have to identify each route, look for any hazards that are along that route, and to be able to identify to that student that route, that client that route. I'm sorry, we call our the people we work with here students because it's a rehab center. And so I slip up every once in a while. I realize they're clients to most people. Um, so we want to point out any bold landmarks along the path. And we want to take them on that route several times to and from wherever we are going. Generally speaking, we have people travel on the right side that's so that they don't have collisions with people later on. Um, and generally speaking, they should be able to move in a safe way so that they're not running into objects and they're not running into people. 
and they're not falling downstairs. Um, so again, identify hazards and discuss it with them so that they can avoid them. Then determine the fastest, safest route to get there. Now, one example I'd use is one time I took a student to a, a hotel and in order for them to go through this hotel, they had to avoid a couple of major obstacles. One was a stairway that went up to the next level and they had to walk underneath that stairway. And so they had to protect their head because otherwise they would walk headlong into the, the stairway, the bottom of the stairway. The next one, however, they had to cross the front of a stairway, an open stairway, which went down. So if obviously if they got too close to that, they would fall and go down the set of steps. That would be a bad deal. So when I am taking a look at an environment, I want to make sure that I determine what the hazards are and determine the best way to cross that hazard. Have them travel the route following the wall and preferably the right hand wall. Now, I make exceptions to that if we are getting close and there aren't any landmarks to specifically identify where they need to cross the hall to go into a door on the other side of the hallway. I may have them find a landmark and then transfer to that side, but then they have only a short distance to find the actual room they wanna go into. Another thing I can do is put a mark on the wall. So I can create my own landmark. I could take a small strip of wood that I know they're going to run into. That's where they're trailing with their right hand against the wall. Um, as they are following, if I put a double stick tape on the back of a small strip of wood, and I attach it to the wall. When they encounter that, all they have to do is turn left, go across the hall, and they find the door they want to go into. So I could I could mark in the hallway too. Um, we could create a tactile map, like I was showing earlier. This is a tactile map of our front office here, and if they can feel what is happening in the environment, we can talk to them about the positions. It can help them to develop a quick, simple um, visual map in their brain, a mental map that allows them to navigate that area much easier. Um, the next thing is you, if you're creating a tactile map, you want to mark all the areas that are needed, not just a single area. So this is one area. I may need to mark other areas too. Uh, this is also true, for example, on devices. If they have to run a machine, uh, initially they may have problems with things like dials. So if they have to set a dial for 25 minutes, we need to mark that spot somehow so that they know that particular uh, spot on the dial. Um, other things is we often have machines that are very low contrast. We have uh, black buttons on a black machine. And, you know, many, many of them have a tiny little white print underneath that people even with good vision have problems seeing we may need to mark that so the person with visual impairment can easily get to that button, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we also need to know some sighted guide. Um, this helps us to lead the person through a path very quickly, very easily. Um, and often, I think if you're working with someone with a visual impairment, you're going to find yourself, for example, going up to their door, picking them up, bringing them out to the car, which they're not going to know where the car is. Um, you need to help them very often through uh, moving around, any kind of moving around. Sighted guide instruction will help. 
keep in mind that a person who has never seen anything is going to have problems understanding color. How, how can you tell a person who's never seen anything what blue is actually like? Now, often we have other associations. Blue is cool, red is hot, yellow is warm. Um, and, but we're talking about a completely different sense. We are not talking about vision. They don't understand, they really don't understand vision. They also are going to have problems. So when you're talking to them, you see you wanna think about the problems that they are having with what you are saying to them. They're, they're going to have problems differentiating, for example, the difference between transparent, translucent, reflective, tinted, and opaque. How are they going to know the difference of this? And you can tell them, while well, opaque, I can't see anything on the other side. Reflective helps me to see the things that are around me, behind me, because it's reflecting in this glass. So I'm looking at the glass, but it's reflecting what's going on behind me. And we can explain these things, but it's still not really going to tell the person anything about it. They're, they have no experience with that concept. Also extreme height or extreme depth or extreme distances. Uh, they're familiar with this place right here, right now, and maybe some associations between, for example, um, the echo off a building and how far away the building is, or the sound of the openness of this room and how big the room is. But generally speaking, uh, if you take them on a tall building and have them look over the edge, they have no concept of what it means to be that high. Um, physical concepts of things that you can't touch, you can't, obviously you can't experience unless you can see them, can be simple things like clouds. And if, you, if they have to cross some streets and we have an unusual intersection, it's going to be very hard for a person to be able to understand that particular situation. If you have those kinds of things and it's imperative that they know about those kinds of things, this is a good time for o &M and intervention. Okay, so first of all, we always teach best practice. We're going to start with sighted guide. This allows anybody who wants to act as a guide to guide a person with a visual impairment. Um, again, we wanna teach the best practice uh, in order for them to be able to effectively and safely travel or for the person to guide them effectively and safely. Um, the client will need to train the people around them when you help them with sighted guide, if that's what is called for, um, you're not going to be there when it's one of their coworkers who wants to guide them. They have to know enough to be able to guide the person who is going to guide them. So, and again, these are things the person should know before you place them. So if they don't, this would be a good place to contact an orientation and mobility specialist to make sure that they learn the very best way to be guided or yes, so that they can teach the people around them to guide them. So one of the things that's very important is how do they grasp the person who is going to guide them? And best practice is take the guide's elbow. And basically it would be, um, grabbing the arm right above the elbow. So the thumb is on the side of the person being guided. And then the next thing is the fingers are obviously on the inside. We wanna make kind of like a cup with our hand with the thumb being on the outside, fingers being on the inside so we can literally grasp the person's arm. Now there are a couple of benefits to this. One is I can firmly hold on so that I don't lose grip. I can't imagine what it would be like to be moving toward a set of steps, for example, and lose the person who is guiding for the person who is visually impaired. They are 
truly screwed if they are being pushed and moved along by a crowd toward that set of steps they're going down and it's going to be a bad mess so hanging on and being able to hold on and and teaching this as though we are in the worst case scenario okay and that's always important but again the thumb goes toward the person who is being guided and the fingers go between the elbow and the body of the person who is guiding. The client should remain about one half step behind the guide. And this keeps a good separation so that the, the person being guided is not running in constantly, running into the person who is guiding them. The client should keep cheek to shoulder, and cheek to shoulder is where, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be seen here. How do we do this? Can we manipulate this? Oh heck yeah, there we are. Now, if I'm standing behind Kelly, my right cheek has to be in line with her shoulder. Left shoulder. Left shoulder. Sorry, thank you. My right, my right cheek has to be in line with her left shoulder. And what this does is it keeps our feet from arguing. I'm not constantly kicking her in the heel or stepping on her heel and tripping her. And I'm not being tripped because I'm, I'm kicking her heel. Um, another thing is in guiding, when, when we are guiding, if the person who is guiding turns and their hand is down at their side, if they turn toward me, then their hand is in a very precarious position. And I think you can see what's going to be here. It could be that in short order, I'm going to I'm going to get touched. And it's it's going to be very awkward, uncomfortable, and inappropriate. So what can happen is the guide can merely put the arm across their stomach or they can actually put their guide hand into their pocket and that prevents problems just literally put your hand in your pocket and that controls where your hand is at any given moment that'll control that problem all right we can go to the next one when we're walking uh, the guide should walk slightly slower to a person who is visually impaired, remember they don't know you and they don't know um, how you are going to guide. They don't know what the obstacles are. They don't know if you're going to forget to let them know that there's a curb coming up. And so they're going to be a little anxious and uncomfortable to begin with. Um, so it is very appropriate. And I, I need to add a little bit here. Um, for a person who is visually impaired, it always feels like the person who is guiding is really moving fast when they're not really moving fast at all. Normal speed is seems very fast. Um, so guide slightly slower than normal and take note of how comfortable the person is. If, if all of a sudden you feel them gripping really, really tight, it's probably telling you that they're uncomfortable and anxious about how we're guiding. The next thing is to do turns. And when a person is going to do a turn, all they have to do is select which direction they want to go. There are easier ways and less easy ways. If the guide walks around the person who is visually impaired, it makes it easier for the person who is visually impaired to turn around. If they turn away from the person who is visually impaired, one thing that you wanna keep in mind is the person who is visually impaired then have to walk farther than you do. It's very easy to stand in place and turn extremely quickly, but that person who is visually impaired has to walk around. So we want to do that very slowly and carefully. I think we can just have a seat for a minute here. Um, when you are approaching a space where you can fit through and only you can fit through, again, we're kind of, the, 
normal walking position is half behind the person who is guiding and half out from the person who is guiding. But if we're going down a narrow hallway and somebody is going to pass us, if we're going through a door, if we are at a restaurant and people are sitting in chairs at this table and the chair is back and the table on the other side, the chair is back and there's very little space to go through between, all we have to do is take our guide hand, our guide arm, and put it behind our back. And that tells the person being guided that we're going through a narrow space. And you can verbally describe any of these things at any time. Um, we, we don't teach verbal, uh, you know, to speak all the time because there are many places where you can't. If it's really, really noisy for whatever reason, if, if it's windy, um, it's going to be very difficult to talk to them about what's going on. So if you can, it's just fine to tell them. But if you can't, these signals should be enough for the person to know to step directly in behind. Okay, so if I feel Kelly's arm go behind her back, as soon as I feel that, I'm going to start and uh, making my arm, which I'm holding onto her elbow with, as long as possible to create the greatest distance between her and me, and I'm going to step directly behind her and follow her very closely and very carefully so that I, I can get through the narrow space too. The next thing is doors and the bottom line to this, it's, it's actually very, very simple. If you can tell them about the door before you come up to the door, you can say the door opens on the right and it opens out that can help a lot for the person to know what to do. If the door is opening to the left, I'm on Kelly's left side, I can just reach up with my hand, find the door and help hold the door. And the rule is if Kelly has to open the door, the person being guided, the person she is guiding has to close the door. But if it's a self-closing door, that can be a problem when you're doing sight of guide. So if Kelly opens the door, I need to reach up, find the door, hold the door so that I can get through too, and then we can let it close behind us. If I'm on the wrong side, there's a very easy technique. I'm gonna show it to you. So I'm on the wrong side because the door actually is on Kelly's right. It opens out and to the right. So I need to get to the right side very quickly to help her with this door. So what I'm going to do is reach with my left hand take her arm right above where my hand already is on her arm. That frees up my right hand. And at this point, I can reach over, grab the door, and make my way through the door. Again, the guide is responsible to make sure that the entire walk with the student with the client is safe. So the, the, the uh, guide should turn around and look and see how the, the client is getting through the door. And if they need help in any way, um, we can manipulate where this, the client is by moving our elbow. So if we need to move the client closer to the door, we can pull our elbow back toward the door and that'll pull the client over closer to the door. Like that's good. With a curb, what happens is if, if we're going to step up a curb, for example, we are going to walk toward the curb. We're going to try to be as perpendicular to the curb as absolutely possible. We are going to slow just a few steps before the curb, stop at the bottom. And the, the, the best clue I can give you on how to do this is stop at the bottom of the curb, have the, the client step up the curb, and or you step up the curb, excuse me. You stop 
as a guide, you stop at the bottom of the curb, step up the curb and stop again. The client will come up to the curb, find the curb, step up the curb and you can both take off. Same going down. Going down, again, we wanna be as perpendicular to the curb as possible. We walk up slow before the curb, stop at the top of the curb. We wait a second, step down, and they can feel as they're holding on to your elbow, they can feel that your elbow is going down as you step down. Or if you're going up, they can feel that pull up with your elbow moving up. So they know which it, which it is, up or down. Um, and when you get to the top, after you've stepped up, you hold there, you stop there for a second, and then when they start to step up, you can take off again. And actually the same is true on stairs, it's just that we have to continue to follow. Again, stopping before we get onto the stairs and stopping as the guide when we get off the stairs. This is very, very simple to deal with. And I'm sure you've seen this before. A person has a visual impairment and somebody who wants to help comes up from behind and grabs them by the elbow or just wraps their arm around them or whatever and starts pushing them along. We have to stop that because essentially what's happening is the visually impaired person, the person who can't see the set of steps coming is moving toward a set of steps and it's it's going to be a bad accident if we don't stop this very quickly if they grab your elbow all you have to do is raise your arm very quickly just literally raise the arm in the air and they can't they can't hold on anymore they just slide off and then of course that person who is being guided or who needs guiding can just turn to the other person and say can i take your elbow and it's very simple, very straightforward, works very, very well. When a person needs sighted guide, they should arrange signals between them and the guide. And we need a signal from the guide to be able to tell the person who is being guided when they need to grab onto their elbow. We also need a signal from the person being guided to tell the guide, I'm ready to go and I'd like to get out of here. Um, and the signals are very simple. If the person wants to signal the guide that they're ready to go, one thing they can do if they're standing, they can just take their hand, point their fingers and set it on their thigh, just like this. And what the guide will do is the guide will walk up and tap the back of their hand with their hand and just hold there. And then the person being guided can merely slide up the arm. It's just slide up the arm and grab the elbow. If they're sitting, I don't know if I can get this enough. Yes, I can. It's the same thing. They're going to take their hand, point their fingers right at the end of their knee now the guide can walk up and just tap them on the shoulder. And on the last tap, they, they maintain that contact. So on the last tap, they just maintain that contact. The person who needs guiding can stand and slide up their arm and grab their elbow. And this makes sure that they don't break contact so we don't have groping. If all of a sudden I'm, I'm starting to move like this, I could, I could end up grabbing the wrong thing and that would be bad. Um, all right, for sitting down in a chair, I think, I think that's the same. That's, that's what I just reviewed. Okay, so we need to keep going. Um, I think I'm just going to let you read through this too. Yeah, I we think it's, it. we've already covered it. Now, very often you're going to be working with a person who needs a cane if you're working with somebody with a visual impairment. 
And if they have a cane and you're doing sighted guide, we have to do something with that cane that helps to protect the, the, the client and at the same time does not trip the guide or anyone else. And so the recommendation we make is that if I'm doing sighted guide, I will take the cane in my opposite hand and hold it straight up and down just in front of the knee on my opposite side. So I'm holding Kelly with my right hand. The cane is in my left hand and the cane is in front of my left knee. And that adds just a little bit of protection and we don't have to worry. Anybody, nobody has to worry about being tripped by a cane. It's a very simple technique. Now, when a person is walking indoors, one of the things that we want to do is called trailing. Trailing is very easy. All we have to do is lightly touch the wall with the hand closest to the wall. And that gives us the person with low vision an easy method to know exactly where the wall is, and they can feel along the wall to find landmarks very easily. The one thing you wanna do is make sure that the fingers are curled so that we don't break any fingers as we run into obstacles on the wall, like a door frame. The only time you'd ever leave the wall is if there are obstacles that you have to walk around or if you have to cross the hall to go to another door. Diagonal cane is very simple. And again, I'm only showing you this so that you can see what a student should be able to do. I'm gonna walk back a little bit. The cane, they should be on the right hand side. The cane should go across their body in front of them and the cane tip should be at the floor where the wall and the floor meet. And all they have to do is literally push the, the cane tip along again where the floor and the wall meet. And they should be able to walk fairly quickly. They should be able to find any obstacles and not run into them with their body or any body parts. They should be able to stay with the wall and they should be able to travel very effectively indoors using this technique. And I, I wanna say that you can review um, on the PowerPoint and on the handout that is given how this is done in just a little bit more detail. Now again, this is to tell you what a person should be able to do. If they can't do this, we really should have orientation and mobility intervention. Um, there are a lot of considerations when teaching orientation and mobility skills. And when the person is learning, we have to talk situational problems. And right now, obviously, we don't have time to talk about situational problems and therefore it is just wise to call for an orientation and mobility specialist to correct these problems. They're very easily and quickly correctable. Uh, get an O&M to do it. The place the foot technique is a great technique and I'm going to demonstrate it using my hands. If we are in the middle of a room and there, we need to be able to find a wall so that we can travel using trailing, but we don't know where we are and we don't know where the wall is and we don't know if there are steps in between. We can very easily move our feet very carefully. I usually suggest that they move about the half the length of a foot forward, which would be about six inches forward. Feel with the foot first, and then they can move the other foot if they have secure footing, they can move forward with the other foot, feel if they have secure footing and then move forward. And the idea is to find a wall as quickly as possible and then they can use the wall for orientation and for balance. And the idea there is now we can move very quickly because we have balance against the wall and we can extend our foot much farther forward 
and not lose our balance and not fall off the edge of a top step, which is very, very critical. This is called place the foot. Again, if they don't have this skill, it might be well to contact an O&M and have this skill provided. I'm going to skip this. It's kind of self-explanatory. We use a yardstick with a magnet to find dropped objects and sweeping with a yardstick beats padding like we usually do. We put our hands on the floor and we begin going around. It's just very, very efficient and it makes it very, very easy. It's just a yardstick with a magnet attached to the end. We're going to skip questions and save that for the end. Um, we're going to talk about some barriers to overcome. And we know that there are a lot of barriers working with individuals with vision loss, but they there are easy solutions to them. The hardest barrier for somebody with vision loss is transportation. And so how are they going to get to work? And it depends on the individual, but and it depends on where they live for transportation. Uh, but some examples, some solutions to the problem would be learning the bus route, or if they have significant disabilities, they may qualify for paratransit, which is a door-to-door -door bus. Uh, taxi, taking a taxi, I know that may be expensive, but sometimes it's worth it depending on their pay. Now, Lyft and Uber are coming to South Dakota more and more, and there's more and more Lyft drivers, and I think Uber is starting soon, and so that's a cheaper, cheaper than taxi. Uh, to get to and from work, and it's becoming more and more common. I know some individuals that don't even have disabilities will use Lyft because it saves them money on gas and, and car insurance and, and maintenance to their vehicle, and so overall it can be a cheaper solution for a variety of individuals. Uh, for people that live out of town, sometimes catching a ride with a coworker uh, we don't expect them to do that for free, so you know it would be a conversation to have with their coworker to say, hey, if I paid you a certain amount of money, would you be willing to come and pick me up? Or family and friends having a support system. If you've got a family member that's retired and looking for something to do, you know, connect with them and say, hey, if I paid you just a little bit, would you be willing to take me to and from work? or finding a hired driver. For some people that are in the professional field, they will actually hire a driver to take them to and from places, especially if there's a lot of travel required in their work. At the employer attitudes, um, there's a, a lot of employers out there that will say, you know, the blind can't work or they work ineffectively or that they need a lot of time and energy or they won't fit in, and then accommodations cost so much, and that the blind will cause an opening for discrimination or their safety issue. But really, you know, the blind people or people with individuals are more dedicated to work than somebody without, without vision loss or without a disability. The attendance rate for people with a disability is much higher, and they don't necessarily need a lot of energy. Uh, we have the resources out there such as you guys to be job coaches so that way the employer doesn't have to train. We have the incentives that our providers can help out and help train and then also uh, accommodations. I think the accommodations that I showed you earlier are very cheap. The most expensive being a portable CCTV or a full-size CCTV, and that's where vocational rehab can step in and assist. But the employer, the accommodations that they would need to provide, providing large print agendas, uh, very easy. Just, just that they're afraid of, you know, afraid of people with vision loss. But if we teach them that these accommodations are so easy, that it would make things a lot easier and they'd be more open to working with people with vision loss. And with the orientation and mobility techniques that we showed you today, safety you know, isn't 
an issue if that individual understands how to get to and from a place safely, if they have the training. They, they are just like anybody else, if not safer. And lastly, client issues. Um, when we work with a client that that just uh, just has acquired a vision loss, they may have some low self-esteem. They not may feel unworthy, may feel frustrated. They can't do what they used to. Um, the print barriers is common with people with vision loss. They're unable to see the agenda if it's not not in a a print that they are able to see. Uh, but with with preparation, with the skills from the vocational rehabilitation counselor, and with with you job placement providers, they will be able to find employment a lot easier. So lastly, I'm going to give you that code word. It is uh, travel. And so we talked a lot about how to get to and from. Uh, when we say travel, we don't mean on a vacation. We mean how to get from one place to the next. So that code word, our second code word is travel. And I know that it is time. Uh, I do want to open it up for questions though. And I will unmute you guys. We have had a couple questions come in. So regarding the rose colored sunglasses, you said they are good for migraines. Are people with visual impairments more apt to have migraines? I would say it depends on their vision impairment and what the cause of the vision impairment is. I think um, people that have had the vision impairment since birth, you know, that's what they're used to. But if they have an acquired vision loss, such as a traumatic brain injury, they may have more eye strain. And with that, they could have more migraines. A person, a person who has a lot of eye fatigue as a result of trying to use their vision when they can't use their vision very well uh, can have more headaches and are likely to have more headaches. And the bottom line is then we have to deal with making the environment more accessible or teaching them how to utilize whatever it is they need to do without vision. And another question, what do employers need to know about a person that utilizes a cane or a guide dog? Probably, it's obviously it's going to depend upon the situation and it's going to depend upon the employer and what their uh, needs are. Um, but I, I would think that most employers need to know that the cane is the person's eyes for travel. The cane helps them to identify the environment so they can use the environment better. Um, and again, the, to me, the, the real answer to this question is, is the person really prepared to travel at work? And if they are, um, they're going to get along just fine with the cane. If they're not, they probably need some orientation and mobility training. With a guide dog, uh, I think that they need to learn that the person can handle the, the dog. They can take it out when it needs to go out. They can travel much more effectively and much quicker with the dog. Um, the dog is a very effective tool. And as a result, um, they are going to be a much better employee with the dog. Uh, the person is the person who has the dog is responsible to make sure that the dog is clean and neat, and and that it is well behaved uh, during its time at work. And uh, very often, uh, most people who have a dog, they keep the dog right underneath their desk. The dog can lay there and go to sleep and do whatever it's going to do while the person is working and it doesn't impact the environment at all. Um, I think that's what the, the employer needs to learn is that the dog really is only going to make travel better and it otherwise is not going to impact the environment. 
And then that last question, we will address that one during our discussion next session. So next session is going to be taught, we're going to talk about resources and uh, we're going to provide you with the information intake form to use while you meet that client for the first time. And we're going to have a discussion. So I plan to have a job placement provider that specifically works here at our rehab center that has the skills and has worked with a variety of different vision impairments to help them find work and hopefully another job placement provider too. And then we will have a discussion on the best strategies on how to talk to employers and how to help individuals with vision loss find employment. So with that being said, please feel free to email me some questions that you have about working with visually impaired clients and we will have that discussion next week. So we've been going every other week, but this last final session will be a week from today. It will be August 14th at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. So I hope to see you all there and thank you for attending today's session. And feel free to email me the code words at kelly, K-E-L-L-I-E dot hoglid, H-A-U-G-L-I-D at state dot sd dot us. And I will send you guys out a certificate of attendance so you can submit for CESP credits. Again, thank you all.